We'll trust the cloud. <laughs> we are trusting the cloud. It, it tells me on Zoom here that we're recording, and I'm going to trust that as well. This is oh, a, a, this is a special um, um, independent pop-up podcast with video thing uh, that I'm doing entirely outside of the uh, the bounds of Substack with no one's permission <laughs> um, because I wanted to talk to you, David Farrier, uh, uh, a world famous independent filmmaker. <laughs> I'll take that. And journalist and writer and humorist and um, lovable, lovable oddball, lovable, lovable <laughs> oddball. Um, I'll take that. Yeah, good. Thank you very much for uh, talking to me about your life in Substack. No, no worries. It's funny. It's been really nice um, meeting in the last month um, or so and talking over all sorts of things behind the scenes and uh, now happy to chat to you. Yeah, great. Well, um, I want to start off just by um, talking about how, how you went from being a TV reporter to um, becoming a famous filmmaker. Well, last time I was in New Zealand and you were around on TV3 uh, doing mm -hmm. these culture stories, being sort of um, the offbeat um, uh, yeah. entertainment uh, reporter. And then you showed up and like I sort of turned away and I, I moved to the United States. I was living, I've been living here. And I turned around and you had made Tickled, which is this phenomenon. And um, now you're an acclaimed filmmaker and you've gone on to do uh, Dark Tourist with Netflix. Um, how did that happen? What, what, what happened that switched yeah. you from being a reporter to a filmmaker? Yeah, I think it was a, a few things. I mean, I, I was very lucky straight out of university studying communications to sort of go straight into a arts and entertainment role at TV3, which was basically covering like the cat up a tree stories, essentially the stuff that would come at the end of a bulletin. And because it was around that was so specific, um, they really just let me do what I wanted. And so I kind of had eight years to kind of hone the kind of storytelling that I enjoyed. It's not like I was being told to go and do a certain thing. I could cover the things that I was passionate about. And I think I kind of developed a bit of a voice through that. And then, you know, inevitably after eight years of working in the same newsroom, you become a little bit sick of it. And I'd been looking and just thinking about what I was going to do. I just didn't know what that thing was exactly. And then, um, you know, Tickle came along and, and I knew instantly that that was a story that I needed to tell outside of the bounds of a two minute news story. And then, you know, I was thinking, do I take that to the current affairs division at TV3 and make it a 20 minute thing? But I just thought, no, like, this is my chance to do something that isn't that. And so um, me and my friend Dylan, um, who came on board really early with that project, we decided to run a Kickstarter um, to make an independent, basically a documentary that would go on Vimeo. And, we did that and we raised about $20,000 and we saw that we had support. And then that's when the New Zealand Film Commission um, sort of heard about it and I was um, put in touch with them. And then it kind of elevated from there. And so it was very organic. It was, the story came to me when I was in the newsroom. Um, I made Tickled while I'd just gotten a new role um, co-presenting a show with Samantha Hayes, who I'd worked with for years. Like I knew her incredibly well. And then Tickled was happening at the same time. And so I got some, you know, I got some, I took some leave from my news job to go and shoot Tickled with Dylan um, and our DP Dom and Cam Sandy. And then during the edit process, I would present that show with Sam at night. And then during the morning, I'd be with our editor, Simon, um, working on the edit of the doc. And so it was done. We made Tickled when I was still full-time at TV3. And then that film got into Sundance and that's when I knew that it was time to leave TV3 completely and just see where the whole thing went. Yeah. And, and you got picked up by Magnolia Films and HBO. What's, mm. what's that feeling like given, uh, given the Oh, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. I mean, the whole, the whole thing was this roller coaster because it was, you know, getting into Sundance was this huge um, buzz, you know, never in my wildest dreams that I expect to have to make a feature doc, but then to have it get into, you know, a, a festival like that. Like I, I was pinching myself. I think we all were. And then we went there and, you know, we, we sort of I met this ecosystem of people and publicists and sales agents and this whole world because it's Sundance 
you know, obviously you've got all these films screening, but then people, buyers are circling. It's going to be like, what's the hot thing um, out of this festival? What's going to be what? What's going to go where? And, you know, we, we caught the attention of Magnolia and HBO and, yeah, they bought it. And that was amazing because, I mean, it would have been amazing just to have, I would have been so excited just to have Tickle play at a festival, but to have it sell is the other thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it all kind of just worked out. It, it created, I mean, it, it helped that a lot of the, you know, a few of the more um, eclectic characters from the film turned up at screenings and kind of got buzz going in that town. Because, you know, um, it's a small town that Sundance is in and word travels quickly. And so it just got some good buzz and it sold, which meant it had a, a life through the rest of the year where it played wider than the festival, which was awesome. And did that transform your life? Um, no, it, didn't, it didn't really. No, I, I came out of Tickled and I think, I, I didn't really expect this to happen, but I think maybe some friends and colleagues thought that once that happens, you just kind of, I don't know what, like you get offers to do things like, oh, you made that sort of crazy film about competitive tickling. Like, here's a cool story. Here's a cool story. You go right back to where it was before, which was like no job. Um, no one's like chasing you. And it's like, oh God, I've got to come up with another idea now and start this whole thing again. And so after Tickled, I just had a year of like a lot of wasted time. I was kind of like basking in the, I, I, I went to different festivals, but I wasn't pitching when I was going to those festivals. I was just there like feeling good about myself. Like, oh, look at me. I've got this, I've got this film in the festival. And when what I should have probably been doing was, was pitching new ideas, but I didn't have any new ideas at the time. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of time where nothing happened. And then, you know, and I, and I started pitching ideas and they were rejected and things fell over. And then just eventually um, I ended up in front of Netflix and I had a few ideas that I took them. And I had um, a friend's idea, um, Mark McNeil, who had had dark tourists in his head for ages. And, and we teamed up, put that idea in front of them. And then they jumped on that. So then dark tourists became the next thing. And so... I'm still figuring this world out, but I, it's kind of like you do a project and what I'm trying to get better at is while you're making a thing, trying to get better at having other ideas percolating. So you're almost starting to make a new thing while you're on the old thing. Yeah. I think that's how this life is meant to work. Right, right. Yeah. One treadmill to the next. What's yeah, the, exactly. Is it a lucrative thing when you get picked up by Netflix like that? Um, it's better way. It's better wages and better money than I got working in a, in a small New Zealand station like MediaWorks. <laughs> I mean, one of the, one of the joys at working in journalism, which is all I've ever done, is that you get really used to not having money. And so I think, anything, yes. I think <laughs> anything that happened to me after working in a newsroom would be like much better, to be honest. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, I, I, I probably talk about what the money's like with someone who works in, in a real job, like, I don't know, like an accountant or law or a doctor, like doing some good. And I imagine the money for them isn't anything amazing. But for me, working in that world and in doc world, it's, um, it's enough of an injection that you can invest that into your next thing. Because a lot of documentary making, from what I can tell, is having times when you're definitely not being paid to do a thing like so much of what I do is coming across a story that I think might be good chasing it using my own resources and my own money no one's going to magically come along um and give you um twenty thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars or five hundred dollars to chase a thing that 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 doesn't exist yet so that's the way I kind of see it. Do a thing, get paid for that thing, and hopefully you can invest that forward into um, what the next thing might be. Right. We talk to a lot of independent writers for Substack and virtually everyone who's using Substack and doing well on Substack and some, some who are not doing so well on Substack are independent yeah. writers and people are trying to figure out how to be writers and make a life in the world like that. Mm. It's got a lot harder now that uh, coronavirus crisis has happened. Absolutely. But for a lot of people... Um, there's a hesitance to take the the leap of faith to give mm. up whatever whatever security they have in, in a job or uh, mm. even if their job is not secure at all so what is it that sort of gives you the courage to take those leaps of faith and to put yourself out there even though you know that there's not necessarily a net there to catch you yeah i, th I think it's 
It's obviously different for everyone. I have an advantage that I, I have, the only person I really need to look about look after in my life is me, which sounds very selfish. I don't have like a million children that I have to feed or anything like that. Um, but really, I just think you know when it's time to go and do something else. And in my experience in life, you know, part of working in, a, in an organization is that you become so reliant on it and, and part of that, and part of the reason you stay working there for so long for very little money is that you think you can't possibly survive on your own. But if you, if you leave and you've got passion for a topic, you'll find a way to make it work. And I'm just so glad that I left when I did because I'd just be, I would be going slowly, um, just un unwinding in that place um, completely, unfolding mm -hmm. mentally, I think. It's, <laughs> um, I think you just, you know when it's the right time. And I think I, I knew it was time to leave TV3 because as well as having tickled that was going out into the world, all my best friends were getting fired by this absolutely batshit CEO who came in, who got rid of, you know, like my mentors at that place, you know, suddenly John Campbell's gone and Carol's gone and well, Hillary's walking. It's like, oh man, like, and, and what, and they're hiring these people to run a gossip site instead, like, okay, it's time to go. So I think when you know, you know, um, and I guess what I, what I've been trying to figure out as well is, which is why I was, I, I'm having a great time at the moment on your platform is that I part of the process of me, I think of finding a big, cause I, what I want to do is make documentaries. I want, to, I want to make visual things that take people on an intriguing journey somewhere strange, but to get that happening, you need to poke things and, and investigate things and find things out. And typically I've sort of been doing that either on, on Twitter, writing about things and seeing what the feedback is. Um, lots of Twitter threads, um, I'll write for the spin-off, um, which is a site that just lets me write and really they let me write like 10 parts about a weird antique store or they let me write in a certain way that suits me. And, and then and they're actually how I heard about Substack because they use it for um, the bulletin, which is, which is this amazing, um, you know, every morning in my inbox, I get Alex Brace summarizing all the, all the news that's going on from all different outlets. And, and I didn't even realize that Substack was creating that. <laughs> that was the thing behind it. But I, when I saw that, I was like, oh man, maybe I can do this myself. And, and what, because yeah, I like being able to put ideas out into the world and, and stories out in my own way before to see what they turn into. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm rambling. Yeah, and you're doing, by the way, let me shout out to spinoff, which is a wonderful publication and mm. guys. Um, and I'm a, I'm a proud member of the spinoff. Um, you've been doing a lot of this work, this sort of creative um, nudging on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. We have hundreds of thousands of people in every yet mm. following you. Um, but, like why why do it on those platforms like and when your audience is kind of mediated by um yeah and, well no no that was the thing i mean the, the reason um the reason i'm i'm sub stacking is that i sort of thought to myself the thought was really like why am i giving all this information to a platform that I have zero control over. Like if, you know, I spend so much time um, writing on Twitter and putting things out on Instagram, if Instagram disappears and Twitter disappears, I've got no way to keep in touch with those people and they've got no way to keep in touch with me. So I thought, you know, instead of the first sort of article I sort of wanted to write on when I, when I started my Substack was that I, instead of doing a Twitter thread, a 10 thing Twitter thread, I just turned that into an article and put that up. And so suddenly I'm able to directly correspond with people. Um, I know who they are. They know who I am. And it just, and, and plus you can still post that on Twitter. Like you can still put that article out to yeah, people. Yeah. Um, and it's in a way where it's not annoying. Like often when you do a tweet about something, but you, I don't even know what it is culturally, but sometimes when you link to something in Twitter, it's quite annoying. You're just like, why didn't you tell me? in this thread, but with the link, linking to Substack, it's so easy to click through to. I don't feel like I'm being an asshole to the people that are following me on social media. Um, and generally the people that have followed me onto Substack are thankful for doing it. So it, it, I, I don't feel like I'm taking stuff away from my followers on, on those social media platforms. Yeah, and I've been looking at the um, comments and it's very early days, you're only a week or two into this with Substack. Yeah. I've been looking at the comments on your posts on Substack and they're 
the people there, they love you. These are like your real devotees. The people uh, who are commenting are yeah. amped to be receiving these emails from you. Yeah, and it is. It's, it, no, and that's something I hadn't really clocked on. You, you know, for for a lot of people out there, they get to get. You know, they check their email, which is quite a personal thing. Like you check your Twitter and Instagram. It's just, it feels like this public forum, but email is this personal thing. I mean, people have had email addresses like for going on some people, you know, decades. Um, and suddenly, like if they receive a message from you, it's a personal thing. And so I think it's it's neat for people to receive because if they like your work it's a curated thing from me to them and it feels very personal. And I'm sort of interested in writing for that as well, because it changes the way you write. You kind of, it's almost like you're writing for a person. You're not, you're not presenting a thing into this huge public forum. It's almost like you're writing personally to someone. And I think that's an interesting way to write and giving people the, the you know, giving people, a word count to reply to you instead of 140 characters on Twitter or whatever it is now. Mm -hmm. That's cool because people write paragraphs and, and the people following are like, well-spoken. I haven't had to delete any comments. It just said, I don't know. It's, it's been cool. Like, I expected there to be some kind of annoying thing happen in this whole process, but it's been incredibly positive. That is one thing we've found and been surprised by as well. <clears throat> we recently introduced some uh, features that let you ban <laughs> commenters if they get to uppity. Um, I have no doubt that someone will come in that I'll ban at some point. But yeah, well, it hasn't really happened that much, even though we've got people who are doing quite um, uh, sort of polarizing work in some in some cases, or like, you know, people on the hard left, people on the hard right, and people Absolutely. on the middle. And part of the reason that we think that the trolls are not really showing up is that it's enough of a barrier to require that someone sign up to your mailing list to be able to put, to put some in. effort in. Yeah, yeah. And then they're on yeah. the and actually, it's even better if you've got the paid subscriptions turned on because then they've got to pay to be in there because you can do the, um, you can yeah. not just make the comments only available to the paid subscribers. So they can be trolls if you want, if they want, but they've got to pay you five bucks each time, you know? Yeah, right. And that's, that's the other thing that I like because I was the other thing because I, at some point, um, I will make it so certain posts are paid for for people that want to pay so i mean my kind of concept is that most of the stuff is going to be for free but for people that like it and appreciate it and have the means and want to yeah they can pay to get not like the best stuff i'm not going to hide like the best stuff away but it's something a bit extra or maybe a bit more of a deep dive into something personal to me yeah. and that feels better than the patreon model because i always thought oh, God, you want to go on patreon but patreon feels to me because as a creator you don't, like, I don't want to come across as like, you don't want to be that like asshole who's like got a Netflix thing and then comes out and is like, give me your money to support my life. Like it shouldn't feel like that. Yeah. And this feels like a good balance of like the free content that just keeps coming that I can write about and do what I do. And then if people want to contribute at some point, maybe I'll turn that on and they can. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, is that the right way to think about it? I don't know. You're the yeah, expert. I, in my opinion. Yes. I think what I, as a reader, I've experienced this, but also I've seen it from the platform point of view, seeing people's feedback and seeing people's reactions. What happens is that people often feel grateful for the opportunity to pay directly to support this this writer or creator who they trust or love. Mm. And it's 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 a good experience. They don't feel cheated. They feel like, oh, this is an opportunity here that I can have a more wow. direct, a more sort of intimate connection with this person and, and, and feel like I'm like one of their insiders in a way. And that, that that's true for celebrity type people and really indie producers and really indie writers. Hmm. Well, I guess it's that feeling you get like, yeah, if you give to a boosted campaign or a thing, you feel you're part of something and you're contributing, which is, which is a good feeling. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And do you see this as, well, what, what do you want it to be? Do you want it to be um, like a serious money making enterprise for you at some point? Cause you're in a position well, from, where it could very well be. Yeah. For me, no, like, and honestly, it's, it's not, I mean, I, I would, yeah, it's definitely not about money. I just, I just want a, a way to put things out into the world and for people to read them and enjoy them. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously if some people end up, if, if I end up putting some paid subscriptions on, I, I don't think it's going to be a, a lot of money and it's not something I need. It's just like a nice little bonus. I mean, to be honest, I think I'd happily keep doing it free forever and still keep doing it because I've been tweeting and writing long Facebook messages for free for about 10 years now. <laughs> and I still enjoy doing that. It's just, this happens to be a better format where I can write longer form things. 
and things that won't fit on because uh, there's still there's that model of something like publishing with a team like the spin-off where you know you have with Substack it's just me at the moment and there'll be spelling mistakes and grammar mistakes because I'm just churning some stuff out oh, charm. and yeah totally and so and certain things I think are better sitting on in a newsroom setting um, like a spin-off and I think some things are better um, something the things I write on Substack I think wouldn't sit on the spin-off because they're too personal or too weird mm-hmm. and so I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's I think everything has its place and I'd happily do it all for free probably but at some point I might as well chuck some little like chuck me five dollars a month because like why not if people want to great I also think it's a good moral thing to do because it shows leadership for the idea that creators and independent writers in particular should Mm. be paid well and not you know paid for the work they do and it's okay to be supported and and it's okay to not feel Mm. like it's begging and it's okay to um you know, find some sort of financial sustainability that lets you invest more in creating this great work that means something to people. Yeah, I think the philosophy is uh, one of my favorite podcasts that I listen to every week is the Slash Filmcast. And, and Dave Chen, who runs that podcast, always says, you know, thanks to the people that donated to us this week, you know, two bucks or five bucks or whatever, um, donate to us if you're uh, financially able to. Otherwise, no, like come and listen to us for free. And I think that attitude of, if you have, if you want to do it, but you're under absolutely no obligation, like what a perfect model to do things. Right, right, for sure. Mm. Um, so you're in lockdown in Auckland at the moment, but you, you're spending increasingly, uh, when you're not um, hiding from the virus, you're spending more of your time in um, LA these days, is that right? Yeah, I, I really like America a lot. And I guess I, I like um, I like the culture and the craziness of America. And I love Los Angeles. Um, I've, I've got a lot of friends that live there. So, I mean, we'll see how the world kind of, how things unfolds post COVID. But I'm, I'm working on a documentary project in New Zealand at the moment that's keeping me here. Um, there's some things that I would like to make in the States that hopefully when things ease up, I'll, I'll head back to LA for a little bit and spend some time there. I mean, I just like, it's such a, a mixing pot of every culture and every, every type of human that's into a certain thing all has their own little niche and, and place in Los Angeles. And that's what I really like that city for. So Dreams kind of like do half here, half there. But it, w- with my stuff, it like it purely depends where a story is happening and what the project is. Um, and if there's something incredible happening in New Zealand, I'd happily be here for ten years. If there's something happening in LA, I'll be there for ten years. It just it, I have no specific. Um, I'll just go where the good thing is happening. That's cool. And can you talk about what you're working on right now? No, not really. It's one of those ones, it's a bit like the early days of Tickled, where it's kind of like if I talk about it, it will, the wrong people will know about it, and then things won't go well for me. <laughs> so, okay, got it, got it. Yeah. Um, one thing we should have done at the top of this interview, this very mm. official, professional mm. interview, uh, was say where people can find your Substack. What's oh, yeah. Name? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my, I just registered a domain name, which is webworm.co. Yeah, um, the dot com to register. I, I understand. Yeah, dot com was going to cost me, I think, thirty thousand dollars. Dot co yeah. cost me about forty bucks. So yeah. I went for yeah. Webworm. No M is com. worth that much. No. Yeah, but the name. My friend Eddie came up with the name, and I think Webworm it kind of it kind of portrays this weird little thing worming through the internet, and that's what I would kind of want Webworm to be about. Just about like this little creature, like just diving into things and discovering things that are hopefully interesting for people to read about. Yeah, yeah. And do you want to talk about your original name for the newsletter and why that had to... Uh, oh, yeah, I, I, I did. I launched yeah. with um, Down the Rabbit Hole, which um, <laughs> is something that I've always said, like, oh, I love going down rabbit holes. But then as I launched, um, a friend just sent me a, a notification. They got on their phone saying, New York Times launches rabbit hole. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. come on. So, yeah, the Times launched a podcast, which is really good, by the way. Um, called Rabbit Hole. My friend's comedy show, I realized, is called Down the Rabbit Hole. Everything's called Rabbit Hole. So I thought, got to be unique. Yep. Um, landed on Webworm. And I'm, I am I mean, what do you think? Is that a good name for a... a, a it's very good. It has, it has a way of uh, burrowing its way into one's mind. Oh, good. And my, my older brother, Rob, d- designed a little um, worm logo for me, which I'm very... It sort of looks like this little stressed out worm with kind of my face on it. It's kind of disgusting. It's a bit freaked out. 
and I really like it. Yes, yes. I'll make sure our production people put it in the blog post that I'm going to put together after this call. Oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for taking the time. By the way, it's also, if you forget webworm.co, it's also davidferrier.substack.com. We'll get you there, right? Um, yeah, or I think I did. I, no, I changed it to webworm.substack. Oh, shit. Okay. Sorry. Name. No, yeah, yeah, I changed the name around. I, I do, and that's an interesting feature you've got on there where you, it's that big scary button that it's like you can change <laughs> it once and it will update all your links. And I was just like, yeah. I'm just going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, magic uh, URL transformations. Yeah, loved it. But no, thanks for the thanks for this thing you built. It's it's. I really like that you've made it, and I'm loving it. And um and I've just written up a piece on um this kind of weird side to tickle that I'd never got to talk about. And I think that's going to probably be one of the next things I do, which I think could get some traction because it's quite a, a unique sort of angle on the whole thing. So we'll see how it goes. But it's all an experiment. Like I, I want to see how this thing plays out. Yeah, that's awesome. That's the best way to use it. Well, thanks a lot and uh, good luck with Webworm and uh, well, I'll, I'll keep following you closely. Thanks, man. Thanks, Hamish. Cheers, David. Um...